Happy Wednesday to you. Welcome back to the Design and Infrastructure Alley. All of you look so bright-eyed and bushy-tailed after the Denali party last night. It's wonderful to see. So I hope you had a good time last night wherever you went. Um, we're back here this morning on uh, Wednesday at DAC in the Design on Cloud Pavilion, which has been sponsored by Google, and we thank them for that. Uh, and speaking of Google, our first presenter for the day um, is uh, Richard Ho, who's going to talk with us. Who's going to... Hello? Hello? All right. Yeah, and Richard's going to talk with us about more is more. So a uh, quick intro for Richard. Richard received his PhD. He earned his PhD in computer science from Stanford University. He was a co-founder of Zero In Design Automation and an early technologist involved with assertions, formal property verification, and CDC verification. He's currently part of the data center chip team at Google working on TPU and other cool projects. Let's give him a warm welcome to the stage, please. Right. Thank you and good morning. Let me just check if the, uh, the mic is on here. Are we okay? All right, good, thank you. So um, to uh, continue the introduction from Derek, thank you so much for coming here this morning. Uh, I'm very appreciative of uh, you know being on the third day of DAC and you're still uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. So today, uh, this morning, what I'm gonna do is spend a few um, moments of the morning to talk about how we might be able to extend Moore's Law, right? Um, and in particular, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the experiences that we had designing accelerators for Google's uh, infrastructure, our data centers, which power Google Cloud as well. So it's been many years now, and the death of uh, Moore's Law has been called on multiple occasions for many years. And it reminds me a little bit about uh, Monty Python's the, uh, the Holy Grail, where there's this guy who's being carried out right by the soldier, and he's saying, I'm not dead yet, I'm not dead yet. And the guy said, yes, you're almost dead, you're almost dead. And that's kind of how I feel about Moore's Law a little bit, right? People have been calling it for, for quite a few years now. Um, but I think we're getting pretty close. Right, so what actually does the end of Moore's Law mean? Um, I'm sure you might have seen a graph like this or this exact graph um, in many talks here at DAC and over the years. Um, but what we're really talking about is as we look at the um, transistor count over years and the frequency of basically mainline processors, right, Intel, AMD, uh, IBM processors, around the early 2000s, we start seeing this plateauing of the frequency that we were achieving, right? The physics was no longer giving us the natural 2x every two years benefit that we were expecting. And as Google in data infrastructure, we really did rely on that Moore's law being able to give us those performance boosts that we'll talk about uh, shortly. And so this plateauing hurt the performance, right? But there's more, more and more, right? Um, there's actually a second right turn. And from an infrastructure viewpoint, one of the key metrics that we look at is performance per cost, right? Performance per dollar. And this has hit a similar wall in the intervening years, right? We used to get a similar kind of Moore's Law effect where we were able to double the performance per dollar spent on our compute infrastructure every two years. This started slowing down in 2012. You know, we were doubling only every four years. And as of recently, that's starting to look really poor, right? It's actually plateauing pretty severely. And this is a big deal for infrastructure companies such as Google. But there's, it gets worse, right? The design costs as the process nodes are getting more advanced is escalating in an exponential. A few years ago, when we were doing the CPU, we were you know, at a much earlier node on that. You know, the cost of the entire development set, including software, prototyping, manufacturing, mass, everything, you know, you're talking 100 million, you know, a couple hundred million. But as we progress to seven and five nanometers, you know, these costs are escalating pretty severely. And so it becomes harder and harder to keep up with uh, technology on that spec. And it gets worse. It takes a lot longer as well, right? In the latest processors, we're talking about 80 mass steps, maybe moving to over 100 mass steps. And the time from tape out to getting first wafers back is growing. It used to take a few months. We're now talking about most of a year. And who knows, you know, uh, it'll get, you know, it, it will continue to grow. And important for us, right, uh, is tape out time to when you can actually go volume production, able to deploy into our data centers. And this has grown now to well over a year, and that's a very um, bad number for us. We want to get our infrastructure out there. So overall, not a happy story, right? This, on the supply side, things are getting much worse for silicon uh, vendors and silicon uh, producers such as ourselves. 
But wait, this is not the end of the story. On a demand side, what we're seeing is consumers um, and businesses requiring more and more compute capacity from our infrastructure. You know, everybody wants to have the latest features on their phone. We want to have self-driving cars. You know, those cars that are, we drive ourselves, the complexity of the features of it are growing. Um, look at Tesla, for example, right? They have what looks like a, a, essentially a small mini supercomputer inside. So the demand is really growing. And when we look at Google, we see this very firsthand. Here's a graph of YouTube uploads, right? And this has been growing exponentially. That is a log scale on the Y side. And so, you know, as of today, we're seeing literally thousands of hours of videos being uploaded every single minute worldwide, right? People want to vlog, people want to put their product reviews out there, and there's a lot of uh, consumers who really see that, and there's a whole economy around this demand. So our demand is not only on the communication, but it's also on the compute that has to support this. Take another example. Uh, this is uh, one simple product in, in the Google's portfolio, which is Search. And Search started you know, way back in 97, more than 20 years ago. And it started out as a simple search bar. I don't know if you remember, it was basically a blank page and a little bar there. It was relatively simple, but over time, the consumers have wanted to have more features. We have provided more features to make the user experience much better. Things such as autocomplete, right? You start typing a query, it would kind of figure out roughly what the query was and it would like try to give you suggestions on it, right? We started getting smart about having um, context sensitive results. So there's a thing called a one box where if you typed in like a sports team name, it would give you the latest sports results from it, right? Uh, if you typed in a, something that looked like a location, it will give you a map in, in the box. And so as we go over time, we're adding more and more features into every single product in the portfolio. And so this means we have to be, um, have multiple data repositories, have more complex IO, um, and have correlation between different products, right? I mentioned search going with maps, right? These, these correlations going in, all of which is continuing to grow our demand. Here's another example, maps. In the old days, it looked a little bit like what you would see in a paper atlas and the location you put in would be a little red pin, pin prick, right? Um, it was simple. Over time, this has evolved, and we add, started adding in the synthetic data, we started adding satellite images on top of it, so you get hybrid views. Um, there was information about transit, there was uh, street view, so we added photos to it, so you could actually see what the uh, you know, location looked like. And then we had real-time data, right? Things like Google Maps for traffic information, Waze gives you a real-time context of what other uh, commuters are seeing there. And we finally added uh, personalization and localization so that the information that you saw was relevant to yourself, right? Things about your local area, your, your stores and um, various uh, you know, meetings that you had or uh, appointments that you, you know, set up. And so this is getting you know, very complex. Here's another example. This is a street view photo that you might have taken. And from these kind of street view pictures, we're actually able to extract a lot of information, right? We can say, for example, that we know what the street number is, we can cite where the street sign is. So we know the address. We may be able to spot a business name there, and so we'll be able to link it with the information about businesses. So when a search for business come up, you, you know that information. And then we think about the traffic. So you might be able to infer from that how the traffic flow works, if there's one way sign and stuff. All this means that there's a lot more data that's coming in and needs to be worked on. More examples, and I'm gonna you know, kind of inundate you with examples just to show you how big this problem is. Um, there's a product called Google Lens that essentially turns your camera into an image search. So you can take a photo um, and you can find other images like it. You can classify it. Uh, you might be able to take a photo of a store and get the information about the store. You can take an, a, a picture of a menu and find out information about the, 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 the things that are actually uh, the nutrition information that's on there. Even more, right? So uh, here what we're seeing is the combination of translate with image recognition. I use this a lot when I travel. I'm not great with languages. I depend on this totally, right? Being able to take a, a foreign language sign and being able to translate it to a language you're familiar with dynamically, right? So that stuff's good. And this starts getting out not only in the data center, but also out onto the edge. So here's an example from um, the Pixel phones where there is real-time image stabilization. So there's both optical and electrical image stabilization. But this requires that there be the compute power even on the edge to be able to handle things like this. Another example, 
smart reply uh, when you're doing Google Gmail. This started as April Fool's joke about 10 years ago. I, I, engineers thought, wouldn't it be cool if your mail could automatically reply to you? Well, here we are, and it does for a lot of people, including myself, right? More than 10% of mo mobile uh, replies are now using that single click where you, <laughs> where you uh, just click uh, the, the onset reply. That's Thomas Dolby, I, I like that. All right, still hear me good, yes? Oh yeah, good, all right. Um, another example, this is more serious, right? Uh, it turns out that uh, things like AI can handle medical diagnosis. This is an example from a di uh, diabetic retinopathy um, where you can take the image and actually start doing diagnosis based on that. And, you know, it was said a few years ago, David Patterson, who was a Turing Award winner last year, professor at UC, UC Berkeley, who's now working at Google, said, you know, if there's a chance that computer scientists have the best skill to fight cancer today, shouldn't we do it? I think the answer is yes, right? And image recognition for medical diagnosis and cancer diagnosis is a big deal. So I've given you a huge number of examples, very large number of examples. What am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that, you know, AI is gonna be everywhere. It's, it's in places where you see it in front of you, and it's in places behind the scenes. What powers AI is the compute that, that are, is on the, the cloud, as well as on the edge. Um, the graph I have on the left, left there, the blue line is the number of ML papers that have been published. Um, the red line is basically the equivalent of Moore's Law, right, doubling every three years. And you can see that the amount of research in AI is basically on a Moore's Law curve, right, and we have to be able to address that. But wait, <laughs> I'm not done yet, it's even worse, right? A few years ago, we had Spectre, we had Meltdown. Um, these were computer architecture bugs, for, you know, you could consider them bugs, where the computer architects, the computer architects who had tried to um, boost performance of our CPUs started using tricks, such as selective execution, multi-threading, and other ways in order to get more power out of the silicon, and kind of extending Moore's law. Well, it turns out that they inadvertently put in some vulnerabilities, right? Um, and the result of that is that now there are software fixes that kind of take some of that back. So the benefits that we had in Moore's Law from these architectural benefits, we're kind of retracting some of it. So the performance of many of the chips are actually dropping again. Um, and you can actually see the effect. Is the software folks are doing a good job of mitigating that a lot. But you know, one of the, uh, one of the little tools that we had in, the, in our back pocket for being able to extend the performance has uh, deteriorated because of that um, issue. So. I'm, you know, I'm not dying, I'm not dying. Well, I think Moore's Law is really dead, right? I think that all of these things are showing you that what we need to do is to try to figure out new ways to be able to extend the performance um, benefit of our silicon. So how can we do that? Right now, the demand curve that I showed you is far exceeding the uh, capacity curve of what we have and what we can foresee in the next few years. Is there a path forward for us? Um, from a Google viewpoint, we think there is. Uh, we think we can extend Moore's Law. Let me tell you how. But one thing is that very critical, we think the status quo approaches don't cut it anymore. We think we have to radically change a lot of the ways that we think about chip design and being able to process it, right? We need to look to other industries for lessons that they've learned when they've hit um, similar type of curves. We think we need to build a community for everyone and we need to challenge the old ways. So how do we do that? The first thing I want to you know, kind of look at is, you know, when you look at this glass, right, the optimist thinks it's half full. The pessimist thinks it's half empty, but if you're a real engineer, you'll think that glass is too big for the amount of water you got, right? You gotta kind of design the hardware around what you wanna do. And that's kind of the solution that we've been looking at. So, you know, at Google a few years ago, we launched the CPU, the Tensor Processing Unit for AI um, our, our applications. There's a whole alphabet soup of processor units that are available, accelerators that, um, you know, you could imagine coming up with, right? Uh, and I think that might be one path, but it's actually deeper than that. We think that you know, this renaissance of computer architecture that you can sort of see around you with the end of Moore's Law and with the advent of accelerators actually presents an opportunity, right? Whenever a door closes, look for the other door that's gonna open. And that's what I think we wanna do, and that's what I'm here to talk about, right? The, these other doors that are opening, how can we extend it? So fundamentally, I'm gonna talk about four things, right? And we think, I think that these four things together support the ability to keep going, right? There are standards and open source hardware, elastic computing storage, which is cloud, um, agile design methodology, which we'll talk a little about, 
and a little bit of faster design with ML, okay? And one of the interesting things is I've been, you know, at DAC a couple of days now and looking at the floor, looking at the technical uh, sessions, and I'm gonna say, I don't think I'm unique in, in pointing these out, right? I've heard of these themes in many places throughout the floor. So I think this is something that the industry is kind of coming to grips with and is known. And what I'm trying to do is bring it together and sort of like tell you, you know, this is what we think as well. So we think open systems are important, right? Google was built on a lot of open source software. Um, life before GCC and Linux was actually difficult. There's a lot of proprietary OSs, a lot of proprietary compilers. Innovation was difficult. Um, and so, you know, even though open source did eliminate the proprietary market, overall, the software market has bloomed, right? We've got lots of new features. Uh, development is going very fast, and customers benefit it. Um, quite often it's said that open source is not as good as proprietary, and I think that's, you know, in general true, right? There, there are obviously exceptions. But good enough for a lot of these things, it can be, as, uh, you know, it can be better than an excellent proprietary if you can innovate faster using open source. As I said, Google has had a long history uh, supporting open source. Uh, it, we benefit a lot from open source, and we also contribute a lot to open source. You know, as examples, uh, in 2016, we had over a quarter of a million uh, commits to it on over 15,000 projects. So it's important for us. Uh, but this is in software. What can we do in hardware? The open source hardware community is quite nascent. You know, there are GitHubs that are out there for hardware. There is um, some efforts going on. But it's not really quite taken off yet, right? RISC-V, I think, has the most uh, momentum and the most attention right now. It is an ISA. It's not necessarily the implementation part of it. Um, there's also an effort from DARPA, uh, the Electronic Resurgence Initiative, where they're pumping in tens of millions and possibly hundreds of millions into providing uh, a new renaissance in the semiconductor industry. And there's a particular program within the ERI called POSH, which stands for POSH Open Source Hardware. It's recursive, um, right? Where, you know, they're trying to promote this open source community. Why do we want an open source community? Well, we think there's some benefit, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but what's important, you know, is how can we avoid the errors of open source hardware in the past, where people have not adopted it, where the quality of the open source hardware isn't been great, right? So I think the quality and widespread adoption is critical. Otherwise, we end up with this situation where there are 14 standards, we want to unify a standard, what well, we have 15 standards at the, at the end of it, right? And we don't want that. We don't want to increase the number of standards, we want to try to reduce the number of things that you've got to think about. One of the things that Google has got behind um, is this thing called the Chips Alliance. It is an open source foundation with uh, several partners. Um, and this is a complement to the RISC-V Foundation. So the RISC-V Foundation supports the open source ISA. Chips Alliance is meant to be a repository and a curated uh, foundation where we can actually put real pieces of RTL with real Verilog, with real verification environments and documentation. And I think those are the key parts of having a successful open source uh, environment, uh, ecosystem, right? Being able to take high quality code and being able to just use it and being able to verify it and being able to know that yes, you know, if you're gonna use this in your silicon or your FPGA, it is gonna do what it says it does because it's been supported, right? It is looks it looks a lot more like a Linux uh, download than it does like a uh, massive project that's put onto a GitHub somewhere, right? Something that you can actually use. You know, I'm gonna just briefly touch on open source CDA. Um, you know, this is DAC, so this might be a touchy subject. Um, you know, there was a panel about this uh, yesterday. Um, I think the goal here is not to reduce cost, right? It's not to decimate the EDA companies. The goal here really is to increase the amount of innovation. And innovation comes from openness. And that's what we've seen in the software world, right, where uh, things are built on top of it. People contribute to projects and actually very rapidly get new features. We think that open source can coexist with commercial interests, and that's what we're aiming to do. There's a big problem with open source EDA, however, which is different from, like, software, open source, just general application software, which is that the technology nodes are difficult. And so it takes a huge investment to be able to create software tools for that. Um, I think this is mostly in the you know, physical design part of it, the implementation part of it, that part has real difficulty, the high cost there. This doesn't necessarily apply to the entire chip design flow, right? On the functional side, it's not so much tied to the process node, it's more like, you know, can you, can you simulate R RTL, for example? But the other important thing is that, you know, quality is super important. Um, if there's a bug in the tool and it results in silicon having a bug, who pays for it? Well, you know, it's open source. You get what you pay for, right? Um, 
but you know, these are some of the, uh, some of the concerns with open source EDA. We think that it's necessary to have some open source EDA to support open source hardware. We think we need to have open flow, but you know, I think that's an open discussion. I'm willing to have an open discussion about that with this community. So that's one thing. Why, why open source? So let me just go back for a second here, right, um, on here. Why is it? Um, I think that we want to be able to focus on the domain-specific things that actually help us reduce our performance per, uh, help increase the performance per dollar number. In other words, we want to focus on the applications. We don't want to have to worry about the kind of the uh, domain agnostic stuff that goes around it. That will I increase innovation. And so the next part I'm going to talk about is elastic compute and storage. Um, you know, we have the booth down in the infrastructure alley, Google Cloud. Uh, we think that design agility requires you to have elastic resources, right? Both in compute storage and uh, memory. Um, and why? Because in the chip design process, there is, um, you know, peaks and valleys in what you, you use. And so being able to ad actually adapt to that, we think, gives you a faster um, uh, path to closure. This is an example, right? I can imagine very clearly that if I had limited resources and I was constrained to say, let's run, you know, 20,000 licenses of uh, simulation a night in order to get my simulation, I would basically tap it out. I would be maxed out early and I would run and I would run and I would run and it may take me a day, it may take me a week, it may take me a couple of weeks to be able to, you know, fully close coverage. Now, if I was able to burst it and get 100,000 or, you know, 200,000 licenses running, I can imagine that I could pull in that time to get to that closure much faster, right? And that's the potential benefit of having elastic resources. So I'm going to do my pitch here, Google Cloud, you know, secure, has vast resources, network, open and flexible, right? If you'd like to find out more, come talk to me, come talk to us on, on the booth um, down in the alley there. What's next? Okay, agile hardware design methodology. This is something that we've played with, and what I'm going to give you here is a little bit of a story, right? This is kind of our experience with it. Um, we have a thing that we call the Edge TPU that was announced, uh, I think, November-ish of 2018. You can actually go online now and find a development board that has it. It costs about $70. Um, it has this Edge TPU on it, so you can run workloads for the, for the uh, IoT applications or on the Edge. Um, it's a relatively small device, right? That, that's a penny there. <laughs> There's two chips on there, right? Um, but it's something that our team did. It's a custom-built ASIC. Um, it's for high performance, low cost. And what's very important is that it was actually very flexible. One of the things, you know, that this design allowed us to do is to be able to target different applications, right? Maybe you want a more uh, processing power on a phone. Maybe you want a, a camera that has less so. So, you know, in a tiled architecture, we're able to address many different design points on the kind of the ML curve um, out on the edge, away from the cloud. And it's important to address the, this, you know, edge versus cloud issue because not all compute workloads want to go back to the cloud. You know, you don't want to necessarily send the data back to the cloud if you don't have to. There are also privacy concerns. There's some things like image recognition on a Nest Cam. You may not want that image, uh, you know, recognition to occur back, you know, back in the web. You want it to occur right there locally, so you don't have to send that private information um, back, back in somewhere else. We did an experiment with this design. Um, we used a language called Chisel. It's out from UC Berkeley, and you know, a lot of the RISC-V stuff is built on it. Um, why did we do that? Well, this. Uh, team that we had was relatively small, and we needed a very efficient design flow for high productivity, and it was very aggressive timeline. But the most important thing was it was very scalable, and that's the one thing that Chisel and other generated languages has over System Verilog. Ch System Verilog, you know, the parameterization um, capabilities is very limited, and that's the thing that we were trying to get uh, over with, with Chisel, you know, get past with Chisel. Chisel also allowed us to do a lot of co-design. So here is a kind of a graph showing the number of ML kind of models that we were running as we were in development. And as you can see, even before we got very far into our design, we were running lots of different ML models and different uh, variations of stuff. And so we were able to co-design using Chisel um, and our ML models um, together. So to cut a long story short, what did we learn from this? And I've actually had people come up to me in the conference and ask me, what was your experience with Chisel? What did you take away from it? Here are four takeaways. Sorry, the frog's kind of small. First takeaway was the Edge TPU was successful. It actually taped out, it actually worked on source silicon, and it's, you can get it now, right? Um, the design team delivered it using uh, Chisel. Uh, we did have to uh, staff up an infrastructure team to support it. And that kind of talks about the next part of it. Uh, no, actually, that's the third part. The other, the second uh, takeaway 
was that there were unique design capabilities that Sugar provided. Um, and the main thing was the co-parameterization of the hardware and software stack. As I said, co-design is a very important part of this, and Chisel allowed that to occur relatively easily. You know, there were uh, language features that were not available in System Verilog that we could take advantage of in Chisel. The third part is a little bit of a negative. Um, there, Chisel is built on Scala. Um, how many people have programmed in Scala? One, two, okay, a few people. I have never programmed in Scala. It's a difficult language. It's a functional programming language, right? Uh, and so, you know, no, our normal design engineers, our normal verification engineers couldn't do a lot with it because a lot of it was based on Scala. And so you couldn't democratize kind of the uh, tool building around it, which is why we needed to staff up a specific Chisel infrastructure team. So there's a missed opportunity there, right? It was built on a, a more friendly language that was more accessible. Maybe, you know, you could have done more. But I think by far the, the biggest lesson we learned was that Chisel made verification harder because from Chisel you go to a generated Verilog and that generated Verilog is machine created, it is difficult to read, it really is. And the Chisel team in Berkeley and our team did a lot to kind of mitigate that, but it doesn't you know, take away the fact that it did make verification harder. Um, and in most projects, verification is the long pole, so you know, what do we do here? We kind of traded parameterization for kind of verification. In some instances, this is a good trade-off, and for us it was a good trade-off, right? But I think it needs to be evaluated carefully. Um, our other very important uh, takeaway here is that co-design for accelerators is absolutely important. Right? You have to take advantage of your workload information. This is the glass being like too big for the water uh, case here, right? You want to make the hardware be exactly what you want for, uh, for, for, um, for your application. And so you know, you're able to trade off across the application, across the firmware, and down into the, the hardware. And so for code design, we think that new design methodologies can help. Chisel is one experiment that we did. You know, we also do other experiments with high-level synthesis, uh, with generators, and with other modeling frameworks. And I think that's where a lot of the EDA kind of uh, community can come and help. The next thing, faster design with ML. Well, you know, I think that ML is kind of the buzzword today. Um, and for me, this kind of took off when I saw this video from uh, Google's DeepMind in London, which is you know, the DeepMind reinforcement learning algorithm, learning how to play Breakout, right? And you know, I have to admit, I'm old enough to have been playing Breakout on the actual arcade things there when I was a kid. Um, and the smart thing here is that it learned much faster than I ever learned that you can score a lot by getting the ball round the corner and up the back, and then it just like knocks off the, the, the thing from the back, right? Why was it good at learning this? And it actually learned this in about 24 hours or less, right? So how was it able to do this? Well, what are the key things? You can see the score going up at the top. There's a score that tells it how well it's doing, and all it's trying to do is optimize that score. And by just playing the game over and over again, it learned how you can actually you know, increase that score really fast. So for me, that was kind of an aha moment, right? Maybe we could do this in chip design, because in chip design, there's a lot of things where ML could have, it could help. Many of the algorithms are computationally hard. Many of them are actually MP complete, um, which means that you need heuristics, right? Heuristics for getting the, the, the tool to actually be performant and to get good quality results. Anytime you have heuristics, ML could help, right? I'm not saying it does help, it could help, and you have to look at it. Um, the other thing, you know, and that comes from the Atari thing, is that there are good fun quality metrics that are available for chip design. Uh, functional verification has coverage metrics of all sorts, you know, including functional coverage and code coverage and, and other things like that. But on, even on the implementation, there's good quality of results things. PPA, right? right? Power performance area. You can measure those in your implementation and you can use those as scores to help ML. So it seems like that there should be a good opportunity here for ML to help EDA. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail because none of this is really ready yet. Um, but you know, in a nutshell, our experience has been that ML is not a magic wand, despite you know, the kind of promise of, of what people have kind of been thinking about. Um, we've also realized that ML alone might not be the full solution. You know, we've been using kind of hybrid experiments where we're using standard techniques, you know, such as SAT or other techniques, and combining that with ML in a way that uh, might give you a better result. But the key thing here is, and I think the, the car team kind of pointed to it, right, is how do you frame the problem? Because ML is actually very empirical, right? Um, quite often, the way it works is that you know, there's a bunch of data, you kind of do some ML on it, you look at the answer, does it look right? No, you kind of modify the network a little bit and then you stir it again, does it look right? And then you, know, you, you kind of use the empirical results to that, right? So there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, almost magic going on in kind of how to set up these things. But framing the problem is very critical. 
data is important. So if your data is designed, there's not a lot of chip designers starting every year, right? So maybe that go won't give you enough data. If your data is run through your simulation, then yes, you can get a lot of data. So being able to frame it is a really critical thing. So I won't actually um, go through you know any details on data. You can come talk to me and see you know what kind of experiments we're running. But we think that you know ML for EDA is a key uh, trend that we actually want to encourage and move on. So. Kind of wrapping up a little bit, Google. Why do we why do we care about this? Basically, we have many services that have over a billion users and growing. Capacity is a real issue for us. Demand is a real issue for us, and so we kind of have to address it. That's kind of one of the reasons for having an internal chip team, and we uh, we want to uh, kind of uh, attack that problem. Moore's law. We think it's dead. It needs help. We think we can help, and I've proposed four things here today. To kind of sort of say, if we do these four things, we have a chance of being able to extend Moore's Law a little further, right? Open source, being on cloud for lots of resources, some new design methodologies, some ML. Um, and with that, it's kind of a call to action. You know, we don't have all the answers. We've done a lot of experiments. We would like the community to come join us on this path to extend Moore's Law, and we're open to discussion and collaboration. So that's it. Thank you very much. Open for questions. Questions? Hey. How are you guys build for your own compute? And what do you mean by compute in this context? Um, for all your verification or you know, the hours that you're using. So yeah, so we are uh, we are a bit hybrid right now. We we started out four, four or five years ago using our own internal farm that's built on Google infrastructure, but we are move, you know, we are in the process of moving to our own GC, our own GCP, our own cloud. And so we've started moving um, many of our workloads on there. We use a hybrid model, and we had a talk about that on uh, Monday in the pavilion. Uh, we use a hybrid model because we do have a lot of internal infrastructure that you know we, we want to keep in touch with as a software. Instead, we do a lot of co-design. And so we burst out to the cloud. We basically you know take uh, workloads, and we send them to the cloud for elastic compute, and then the results come back to our internal network for analysis. There's a question right there. Yeah. Hi, Steve Scott. Uh, you talked a uh, bunch about your uh, experience with Chisel. So one question I have in that regard, and perhaps not so much in that regard, is uh, how do you, how does all this tie in uh, to early exploration, right? I mean, before you get to the actual design side of things, that the architecture and early exploration phase that happens, and often that's separate from the design side. So these. Yeah. So I yeah. do you have so, thoughts about tying so that in? The kind of design space exploration, right? Looking for that, I agree with you. So that's where the co-design matters. Chisel is not a great language for this. And you know, I think that this is one area where we can uh, use and look at different things. But that's an important part to be able to find the right design space, right? Like I said, you know, you've got to find exactly the right kind of architecture to hit that problem well. Um, there are other methodologies, and we're open to discussion. I, I agree with you, Chisel is not necessarily great for that. It's better than Cisco Verilog. <laughs> we were able to do more of that because there's a software, you know, C component of it that we could actually co it with very easily. But it's not necessarily the best uh, space space exploration um, tool there. Yeah. Hey, Amber. Uh, hi. A quick question. Um, you listed those open source cloud new design methodologies in order to help. Can you give a prioritization? Like we can't do everything. <laughs> um, yeah, you can't do everything. I, I think that the most immediate is cloud, right? I think you can actually people can move on that right away. Maybe I should have put that first. Um, in, the, in the space. I think that open source and design methodologies, they're kind of percolating, they're there. Like I said, the open source community is kind of nascent, but there are efforts and it is picking up momentum. And I think some new design methodologies are starting to pick up some momentum, right? So I think those are next, and I think ML is further out. You know, That's why I had very few slides on it, you know, much detail on there. I think it's much further out. I think it's good to be looking at it, but we're not really close to it yet. You know? Thanks. Uh, great talk. Uh, yeah. Um, 
question is uh, uh, Google has so many applications, right? so many uh, 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 basically the uh, uh, users for your, for your design teams. Uh, how do you actually bridge the gap between the, the user's need versus your design capacity? Because if everybody wants their own chip, you won't be able to. <laughs> Yeah, capacity, yeah. So that is an issue. I mean, we do monitor the capacity needs and we build as fast as we can. In fact, the original CPU was exactly like that, where we monitored the user's needs, we saw the trend graph, and we knew that, you know, a couple of years down the road, we would need to have double the number of data centers. And so that's what kicked off the original CPU silicon optimization effort, you know, to be able to address that workload that we could see coming. And quite often, you can see the, the, the you know, the bump in, in data. We showed you the YouTube. A lot of these uh, usage graphs are, are actually quite predictable. Yeah. It was a really interesting lecture, and I am I have some question about the Google Maker uh, chipset. Yeah. What's the main purpose of the Google Maker chipset? And is it just reducing the cost, or and another like a yeah. plan for? What's the purpose of the Google Google yeah. uh, uh, chip efforts? Right. Yeah. So yes, it is a couple chipset, of things. Chipset. The chipset. Chip. Chipset. So yeah, the CPUs? AZ. AZ. Yeah, CPUs. Okay. Um, I, I think you meant the CPUs. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, so it's a couple of things. One is it provides capabilities, right? Being uh, very performant, it can provide more capability to our ML researchers, which is a big group for us. And two, yes, it is more cost efficient for us to do that, right? Um, you know, at the time, GPUs and were being occupied by Bitcoin, <laughs> right? And so they were actually hard to uh, get, right? And so, you know, having custom silicon that was targeted towards the workload that we knew we had to accelerate was a quite logical business decision that we made at that time. Um, and so that will continue to be. I think it's not our intent to replace, you know, uh, silicon vendors, right? Like, we don't want to compete with other silicon vendors. We want to complement them. So they're dealing with, you know, general compute and other things, networking that they're really good at. And what we can do is identify where we can provide additional optimization, additional customization to help our workloads, and it's not being addressed by the general silicon market. Hello. So, um, how do you expect the uh, open source and EDA to play together, and uh, what's the what's the way of you know innovation gets into EDA? So. How to open source and EDA play together? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think that you know EDA as a whole is one of the last kind of communities to kind of embrace open source. Open source has been embraced in many other industries, but I think we're one of the last. I think it requires a mindset change. There was a, a, a talk yesterday about a mindset change, um, and it requires that there be not you know uh, understanding that it's not necessarily bad for EDA industry, right? That we can actually. Uh, improve and innovate on that, and people are free to go ahead and commercialize part of it, right? The Linux world has commercial operations based on the open source, um, open source uh, code, right? And equally, I think in, in EDA, I think there's a chance to innovate on top of open source code, right? We, we, what you don't want to do is reinvent the common stuff. What you want to do is in, you know focus on the innovation, and I think that there's a chance for that. I don't think we're there yet, but. You know, that's what a call for action is, is here is about. Is let's think about it and let's see if there's a way to make that work for us. Oh. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, you talked about uh, the wall with his compute performance. Uh, can you also comment on the communication between the chips? Are we using that wall as well, uh, or is it different? Uh, you know, uh, within the system, you mean? Within the system. Yeah, I think we are. I don't have data on that, unfortunately, so I can't really speak in too much detail. I, I haven't looked at that myself. I think we are, but I, I, you know, maybe we can take that one offline. I don't have good data on that one. Yeah, thanks. Good question. Okay. All right. Thank you very, thank much. you very much. Great talk. Thank you.